So this is joint work with uh, Michael Sumner, and who's regrettably not here, and Etienne Racine, who is, who is here sitting in the fourth row. And uh, I'm pretty confident, I think I can promise you that there will be the only uh, talk in this session without moving images. Yeah, so um, I talked last year about simple features, and uh, so uh, I couldn't find a better summary than this lovely uh, um, uh, graph, that, uh, this lovely illustration that Alison Horst uh, posted on, uh, on Twitter recently. Uh, simple features basically makes uh, handling feature data, so that's points, lines, and polygon data, easier, uh, spatial data, easier in R, uh, because it kind of glues uh, stuff on uh, as an additional column in your, in your uh, table, in your data frame or table, and uh, keeps them there. And then you can do all your regular manipulations with that. Uh, in, in addition, you can do all kind of spatial operations, like spatial joints and uh, 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 operating on the, on the geometries. So uh, that was sort of uh, uh, caught up very well. That is the good news. So there's a strong uptake of a simple feature package by both users and developers. Uh, and we improved by that the interoperability with spatial databases, GeoJSON, and also of coordinate reference system handling in, uh, in R. Also, spatial indexes are computed on the fly, for instance, by uh, SD Intersect. And we have now uh, also uh, plot support in ggplot2. Uh, that takes care of reprojecting uh, incompatible layers. Um, there is an uh, additional thing uh, that is uh, that we added to uh, that we added to uh, the simple feature package, and that is the issue. Like, uh, it is very easy to find out whether a point lies inside a polygon or not. That's a simple geometry problem. But then, if you work with properties, like you saw here we, uh, in this graph, that we work with geometries and properties of these geometries, uh, it's not so easy to assess when you query a point in a polygon to assess whether, what a value would be. So if you have on the left-hand side, for instance, a land use map, you can reasonably say that at a particular point in that polygon, the land use will be forest. But if you have a population density map, which is also a polygon with a value, you cannot say that because the population density is, a, is an aggregate property over the entire polygon. So we made categories for that, and that information is propagated. And if you don't know, or if you uh, are on the right-hand side of the figure, you get warnings when you query uh, these points that you basically uh, make assumptions that are not sort of supported by the data. So this is all very nice. It starts getting uh, uh, it's sort of sort of challenging, more challenging when you have time-dependent data. So here we have the classical North Carolina sudden infant death data set. Uh, where we have two rounds of, uh, uh, of measurements in 74 and 79. This is one of the first uh, 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 published spatial statistics uh, uh, data sets. Um, and we can sort of plot them, and then basically we have them in two, as two columns in the data set, and we need to use Gather here to, to stack them into a single column, and then we have to replicate all the geometries, and, and we can do that. But then what happens if you have like 50 instances of time, or when you have 500 or 5,000, you would have like 5,000 columns, and you were going to stack all of them and so on. It's getting very messy. Um, and also, keeping time in columns is not a good idea at all, because where do you put the timestamp? So that you would have to put it in a column name. So time is an issue there. Um, we have time-dependent data. Where do we, do we put it over multiple columns, or do we recycle features if we put it in a long, in a tidy table? Uh, that is all not, not sort of not uh, ideal. Uh, ggplotting is some, something of an issue. There is also a sort of recurring question of the support for raster data uh, and the solid vector and raster integration. Uh, this is something you can em em emulate by sort of you know, having points on the raster or little square polygons, but it is not going to bring you far in a sense of scaling. Why raster data for those not involved in, in the raster uh, uh, world? Well, vari variables that vary continuously over space or over time are typically represented more naturally by regular sampling. Yeah? So think images do that, still images or video. But also, also Earth observation data. So satellite data, we have now visible uh, uh, satellites that give uh, uh, information about land, about ocean, about temperature, radar satellites. We have satellites that measure atmospheric composition. And these all come down, uh, come down freely now. Uh, Europe is here clearly on the ball at the moment. Uh, the, in the Copernicus program, where they have like a li little bit less than 10 satellites now running, it uh, comes down with 150 terabytes per day. So that's 
that's quite a sort of that's quite a bandwidth sort of the, the data sets that you can uh, that you can have access to also climate data climate model data is also uh, free and large the climate the coupled model intercomparison program will generate sort of over a couple of years around 6 will generate 15 to 30 petabytes uh, that's a data center i imagine uh, and there are numerous other sources of, of raster data that, that are of interest to you. And that is also what really motivates me, that there is so incredibly much free information that is collected or generated uh, that, you could, that you could get access to and, and use if you could use it, right? But it is so hard to, to do it quite often. So here's an example of an image that comes from the Sentinel-5P that where six months of data were sort of thrown together. And this looks like what you typically see from models, but this is actually measurement. This is measured atmospheric uh, composition. So this is six months of images compiled together. And you see sort of for those living in Europe, you see fairly familiar pattern. But what you, for instance, also see is the, is the, sea, is the, the ship lines flowing here. So you see even the NO2 emitted by, the, by, uh, by sea traffic. And it is quite revolutionary that you get this from pure uh, measurements. There's, of course, a lot of heavy processing going on there. Uh, the thing to sort of the way out to handle time properly and to deal with raster data and to deal with more complicated data, uh, in my eyes, was that of data cubes. And data cubes, uh, the idea of data cubes goes back to OLAP cubes, which is sort of, there's a, a, a paper from Jim Gray on this, uh, mentioned on Wikipedia from 1996 sort of where values basically are given for each combination of dimensions uh, for dimension values. So we can have sales by product store and week. So for every combination of product of store and week, we get a sales figure. We can have population by gender, age, class, region, and census uh, around. We can have temperature by XYZ and time, a four-dimensional uh, data cube. We can have screen pixels here, like which are two-dimensional or which vary, and then it's three-dimensional like video. Uh, we can have also forecasts, so like weather forecast, by time of forecast and time to forecast. So we have two dimensions of time, covering time. And that sort of varies down by variable, by x, y, and, and, and altitude. Uh, why not handle them entirely as tidy, as long tables, as ERO would, would suggest in, in that Sybil? Well, there is storage to speed and indexes, right? I sort of welcome anyone to put a video stream into a sort of X, Y, a time, uh, red, green, blue uh, a data set. Uh, you, you don't do that. Um, so you could do it, but it's, it's, sort of, it's, not, going to, it's not going to scale up uh, really much, yeah? only for smaller subsets and so on. Um, then, so what we do is basically um, uh, working with arrays, right? And arrays are, the array has a long history of support in uh, Bayes and also in Dplyr. So Bayes array is a very strong uh, structure that has dim names, and dim names are pretty limited because they're characters. So if you want to put time in dim names, then you have to encode it as character and it's messy. But the good thing is that you can use apply, so that means you can sort of uh, cut out, you can aggregate of particular sets of dimensions. Uh, you can do uh, subsetting for slicing, cropping, and, and slicing and dicing. Uh, there's a bind support, arrays are atomic. Then there's the tibble cube in dplyr, which is sort of a, a structure that hasn't received very much love or exposure, but it's, it's, it's relatively a cool idea. It's a list of arrays. And it uh, mimics by that basically heterogeneous uh, array records. Uh, and it has an additional list of factor with dimension values that's much more flexible than dim names that can also have like date, uh, date structures and so on. And it has filter methods and group by stuff. But it cannot, for instance, deal with uh, simple features as, as dimensions, what you would do. So, and, and it doesn't also doesn't have uh, support for regular dimension, meaning if I want to map sort of uh, my, my space linearly to a, a dimension index. So what we do in the STARS package, in the STARS project, is to implement raster and vector data cubes. And those are ND cubes where one or more of the dimensions relate to uh, space and typically one of also to time. So raster data cubes typically have X and Y, take spatial dimensions, and vector cubes have a single uh, dimension that sort of lists the points, lines, of polygons that, uh, that, that, the, cube, that the index uh, refers to. And then we have... Um, we basically have a list of arrays and sets of dimensions, uh, have regular dimensions, uh, dimensions as values, and uh, take care of measurement units and coordinate reference systems, uh, do the I.O. with GDAL, which we already did with SF, 
uh, also do in, a lot of work with NetCDF, which, which Michael Sumner is very instrumental in that side. Uh, and we support out of core and uh, we will support cloud processing and we'll say a little bit about how that works. So you think that raster types are easy, well they're not. So there are all these kind of varieties, this is the nightmare for the developer. The first three sort of have linearly map X, uh, array index to X and Y. Uh, the last two do not do that. This is like a graticule, but it basically if you have a regular uh, raster on the earth and you then project it, then it becomes automatically curvilinear unless you do resampling to a new regular raster, which is what, what GDAL calls warping. So here's an uh, image uh, similar to what I showed last year of uh, what STARS does. So we read here a little GeoTIFF, uh, and we, by, but here we use ggplot and we use a geom STARS, which is very primitive, which is a 10-line function that essentially decides should I call geom raster or should I call geom tile depending on what I have or geo geom rect, it was geom raster or geom rect. Um, in any case, uh, a lot of other things you need, still need to do, like core and equal and so on. Um, and this basically plots what is there, plots the data. And that is, that is kind of okay, but it sort of makes it, into a, makes it into a long data frame and then plots all of the pixels. And that is okay up to the moment that your data are sort of, you know, this size that you have like a typical Sentinel-2 image has 10,000 by 10,000 uh, pixels, which means it's a 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer area with 10 meter grid cells. Yeah, so this is the state of the art in visible remote sensing, free data. Of course, uh, um, intelligence data, uh, sp spy satellites have a much higher resolution but are not open. So if I plot this thing, you think, hey, it's what is, what's happening here? The thing is basically red here, uh, by saying proxy is true, and what then happens is that none of the data is read, that only the metadata is read, meaning that only the dimensions are being read, but none of the image pixels are being touched. And when I plot this data, and that's why I didn't do it with ggplot and sort of convert it into a, a markdown, because that would sort of take every time 10 minutes to, before my markdown compiled into slides, and you can't work like that. So this plot method here looks at, hey, what is my plot? sort of area, how many pixels do I have there? Oh, that's much less than 10,000 by 10,000. That's only 800 by 800. So let's downsample. Let's only read as many pixels as I maximally can uh, view and then uh, sort of render them and, and throw them to the plot device. And that is sort of in a matter of seconds uh, done compared to sort of five or 10 minutes. And you can you know, continue on this idea. So we have an ST apply here that is applied to this object, which is still not red. Uh, and it says, to the dimensions X and Y, apply this function, which is NDVI, which computes a vegetation index by combining two bands, which is this little function. So it applies this to every uh, pixel, because I have four bands here. Uh, it complies, uh, applies it to every pixel. Uh, and you think, oh, this is going to take time because it's going to do this for this 10,000 cells. But no, it does nothing, as you see here. And only when I plot this thing, then it does something, but then it sort of re it changes execution order. It says, oh, I have to plot something. That means I can downsample. Um, and it downsamples, and then it reads only the downsample data, computes the NDVI for those, and plots the thing. So this is sort of a, a query optimization, you could, you could say, by, uh, by this. Um, <clears throat> cloud proxies, something that we have in mind is where the data are basically not in your local machine but in the cloud. Uh, and the next idea is that of a data cube view where you, um, where you basically s have to mention settings that you don't read from an image but that you set independently and we basically query the imagery on this uh, these setting. So you could have then, for instance, a collection of images that are in different projections like you typically have with Sentinel with a satellite or uh, also Landsat data that they are in over different UTM zones and, and sort of handles that. An idea that is pioneered and inspired by Google Earth Engine, a very strong platform. So a lot of, non, a lot of data are of course non-cube non data, right? So we have like spatial temporal events, we have spatial networks, we have movement data, and there's a nice sort of data set that is also in the deep plier uh, available as, as a subset of this in the deep plier uh, package called Storms. Uh, for, from this hurricane data set, which was luckily still uh, in the air. <laughs> it's also not updated that regularly, I think once per year or something like that. This here you see is the color, the year of the, uh, of the, of the hurricane and the, the path it took without reference, only the, uh, the latitudes and longitudes. And this is difficult to interpret, right? So this is a time series and question is like, is there anything changing over time? But they are all kind of, you know, it's a hairy ball. 
Um, so, so what to do with it? So you can cut it up and you can say, oh, this is nice uh, ggplot and so on, and then, but it's still a lot of hairy balls and you can't really tell. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of overlap, so you can't really say is anything increasing or, or decreasing or because all, all the overlap means you don't know how much there is. So what you would do is really sort of uh, make little boxes and then count in these little boxes, and that's exactly what I did here. So I made little boxes, so I made a raster basically in two dimensions, and then for each of the raster cells, I intersected all of the lines and counted sort of when there was a sort of an, a part of the hurricane going through the raster cell. I counted and I counted the number of raster cells. And now if you're really smart and you think, hey, but this is running from 10 degrees to 80 degrees, so what's happening here is of course that raster cells, if you would have regular, if you would distribute them regularly over X and Y, you get sort of boxes on the earth that are of completely different size because they get all the time they get narrower when you get close to the poles. So this would not sort of work very well. But what I did is sort of I, um, I, I made this uh, sort of this, the Y direction uh, increasing. So they're sort of they're very narrow in the south and they get sort of uh, uh, taller when, when you get more north so it's such that we have approximately uh, equal uh, areas for these, for these boxes and that means it's a rectilinear grid and then uh, counts are proportional to densities. Um, and you could, of course, uh, that is ignores length and duration and strength, so you can do, you can do much further, much more with this data, but this is a very sort of simple, uh, simple analysis that I started with. So to conclude, spatial data science is an exciting field full with data, maps, challenges, and tidyverse extensions. Uh, with SF, the simple features package, we extend the tables to spatial tables, and with the starts package, we extend that to raster and vector data cubes, and that includes spatial time series as a special case. <clears throat> Stars can do out of core raster, is lazy, does some optimizations there, and will eventually address also cloud raster processing, which is where everything is going uh, in, in this world with, in terms of these data sizes to do something useful. Uh, we can analyze big image collections interactively only when we downsample cleverly, uh, and um, there is more to read about sort of the, the stuff that we do in the book that I'm writing together with Roger Bivent uh, called Spatial Data Science, which is, has a link uh, here. So the slides are in a tweet that I sent an hour ago, the link to the slides. Uh, and also I want to sort of uh, draw your attention to a, a Spatial Birds of Feather meeting which takes place tomorrow at breakfast. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Edzer. And uh, we have time for a couple of questions. If you could stand up and raise your hand, <laughs> that would be helpful. Corroborate. Could and you repeat that? Um, the, so SF is for vector spatial data and STARS is for raster. Are they going to interoperate in, in some sense ah, uh, so to align the, the coordinate system? So, and so yeah, on? this is a, that is a, uh, I should have put in this full, I should have put this full with, uh, with uh, uh, vector data cubes. So this is the confusion. Um, the confusion is this, that STARS is about raster data, yes? But STARS is about spatial temporal data cubes. And there are two types of data cubes, raster data cubes and vector data cubes. So if you have like, um, like this kind of data uh, geometries with time series, yeah, then geometries is one dimension and time is another one. And you could have like population data per region by age class for different censuses, and you have a 3D vector data cube, right, where space take only one, takes only one dimension. So it, it does both, and by that it integrates it automatically. So you could do an aggregation over your raster uh, and reduce the, two, the X and Y dimension into a set of features which could be, which could be polygons. Thank you, good question. No further questions? All right.